Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the baronial halls of Castle Brigantine. Before you, a moment frozen in time. Satan's banquet, where the wine of blood flows eternally amid the most notorious dealers in death the world has ever known. A five-story tall wooden castle along the beach in Brigantine, New Jersey, brought terror and delight to millions of people during the 1970s and 80s, and led to a haunted attraction renaissance along the East Coast. This is the story of Brigantine Castle. <laughs> Brigantine Castle was located on the beach at 14th Street North and Brigantine Avenue in Brigantine, New Jersey. The location of the castle was originally an old fishing pier known as Seahorse Pier before being purchased by Carmen Ritchie in 1975 for $90,000. Carmen's parents, who were originally from Philadelphia, vacationed and ran businesses in Seaside Heights, New Jersey. This introduction to entrepreneurship along the Jersey coast led him to purchasing the Seahorse Pier, but the idea to build a haunted attraction came after taking one of his daughters to Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Well, at the time, there were trailers uh, in, throughout the country doing live acting and basically I took my daughter into one and she got scared and I figured I could improve what was there. My mind always works to, to maximize things. Carmen served as the creator, designer and supervisor of the project and worked with four other men to build the castle. The team consisted of Jim Demuse, artist and designer, Bill Browning, artist and lead designer, Fred Mahana, artist and designer, and Bob Dorian, designer and voice of the castle's advertising. Selling the idea of the castle to the city of Brigantine wasn't a challenge for Carmen. I made up a scale model, made the presentation, and uh, they rolled out the red carpet. They were very interested in getting something because the pier was uh, dilapidated and closed. They wanted to get a tax rateable off of it. Construction of the castle complex began on January 1st, 1976, and was completed in 150 days for approximately $350,000. In addition to the castle, the pier included an arcade, restaurant, fishing pier, miniature golf course, and various stores, games, and concessions. The construction of Brigantine Castle in such a short period of time was an amazing accomplishment. And at five stories tall, the castle was the tallest wooden structure in the United States at that time. The castle opened for Memorial Day weekend of 1976, and the attendance was beyond all expectations. Opening night, the line was all the way through the building, which was cattling, all the way down a ramp and a block away from the castle. I was prepared to be busy, but not that amount of people now. During the following years, people continued to flock to the castle, mainly due to Carmen's extensive advertising campaign in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. The advertising included brochures as well as chilling radio and television commercials. The television commercials were produced on film by Bob Dorian, who also read the narration for the commercials. From its lofty towers high above the sea to rat-infested dungeons and hidden graveyards, there is always someone or something dying to meet you. Brigantine Castle, it's alive. It took approximately 30 minutes to walk through the castle's various rooms. The props inside the castle came from a variety of sources, 
Like when you first came in, you saw a wax museum. That was my idea. It cost me like $40,000 for those wax figures. Eric Prince got a job at the castle helping with general maintenance in 1979, at the early age of 15. He continued to work at the castle until it closed in 1984. As he got older, he would work as an actor in the castle's many different scenes and help to repair and replace props. Eric still has vivid memories of the castle's layout. You would go in past the ticket booth. On your left-hand side would be the Bernier Hall. That was the Wax Museum Satan's Banquet, where you saw all the wax figures. Then as you went up the stairs, there was a little cave on the side. Then there was a position called First Cage. It was a cage area with someone that would scare you. And that's where you see people running up the steps all the time. There was someone right there. So you went up to the top of the steps. That would trigger the thunder window, which would let the butler know. You go up a couple steps. Then you go across the butler area. The first scene that you would see, depends on what year, it was the slime creature my first year in 79 and that's the creature with all the tentacles and that. Then from there, you would go into the portrait room. You go in there, you're waiting under the chandelier, then on the carpet. He would hit the foot switch on the floor, and then all the paintings would change on the walls, and then after a couple seconds, that Turner gets nervous, he would jump out of the frame, give you the warning speech. Then you would go into the throne room. That was the king and queen down there with the, the one down there, and usually had a jester guy in that room working there. You also had mechanical band one year. It would always change, because you could do whatever you wanted there. Then you entered the swamp, which is one of the cooler rooms. You would swear the swamp was way bigger than it was. And then it would turn around and it was the ripper scene. The ripper scene was a black art scene where there was a girl tied up and there was black lights. Then you had two lanterns at the top that were red. They were distortion lights. So what you don't realize, they were faded on the back. Whenever you have a scene like that, your eyes will focus on the brightest objects. Your eyes will look up. So it just looked like the person was tied up. And they go and you slit her head. And he had the choice either to take her head and impale it on a spike or throw it in a trash can and slam the lid down and then chase you up the steps. Then you went up to the plaza, which is the pustulatus plaza. The plaza was a movie theater and you had a choice between one section, which was the headless woman. And if we weren't doing headless, you would go through the bottomless pit scene where you go up and there was a pit that looked like it dropped down like thousands of feet with little skeletons and stuff down the bottom. And then you come to the butcher shop, Desaad's butcher shop, and there's a person that's a butcher and he comes out of the butcher shop and all the body parts and that stuff. And then you go up a staircase, you go up another staircase, and then it was the sacrifice room. And you go up another staircase, landing up another staircase, and you wind up at Rat Professor. We had a wax figure with the cage strapped to his face and the rats nibbling on his face. And you had a podium there, and a really cool mural villa done there. It's like a boardwalk going into infinity with all these sticky people riding these flies pulling their eyes back. Then you go outside on the parapet, then you go into the rat room and get them on there, slam the door. So the rat room would go straight back, do a turn around, come back the other way, then come back to a half part. And there was a scene in front of you that was this hairy piratey kind of looking guy that had like a sword and the rats were stuck to that, like an impaled a rat and the rat was wiggling around and there was little rats that would pop in and out of the dresser running. The Rat Professor and the Rat Room were the most memorable areas of the castle. This was also Carmen Ritchie's favorite area. Why I say the Rat Room? Because it was the least expensive to build and they got the greatest excitement out of the people. Dr. Rat used to wind them up before they went into the room. What it was, it was a narrow area and it was rubber hoses sticking out, but you were so psyched up before you got into the room that you thought it was rats touching your legs. During the early years of the castle, there would be approximately 50 employees working each night. Many of the castle actors were theater majors from colleges in New York and New Jersey. Every year we always had hundreds of applications. Kids that wanted to do acting and uh, performing. Extroverted type people. Sandy Battellini was the manager, and she came up with a lot of the scripts for them, and they went over. I left it to her. She did the day-to-day -day, uh, work with all the different actors. They all wanted to be performers, and it was kind of like uh, rehearsals and stuff all the time. I mean, some of the stuff they came up with was crazy. They would do Adam's Family Night, where we would do spoofs on the Adam's Family and that, or this one guy, Harry, he did the rap professor as a musical for the rap professor, you know, join the something when you want to be and the ratzels. I forget the whole song, but it was amazing. Amazingly talented people. They were all actors. After the initial success of Brigantine Castle, many similar attractions were built along the Jersey Shore, including the haunted mansion at Long Branch and Castle Dracula in Wildwood. After the unfortunate fire at the haunted castle at Six Flags Great Adventure in 1984, which killed eight teenagers, Haunted attractions began to disappear at amusement parks due to increased liability. 
Although Brigantine Castle was up to date with fire codes, the pier was found to be structurally unsound, especially in the backmost portion that served as a fishing pier. Many of the structural issues were the result of a 1984 storm that caused $500,000 in damages to the pier. Although the pier had federal flood insurance, the government refused to pay the claim. I put a claim in and I learned a new word called disallow. They disallowed the claim. They just disallowed it. The government can do whatever they want. In addition to the structural issues, the castle had also experienced decreased attendance throughout the 80s. You reach the point of diminishing returns where the investment you made into the building of anything new wasn't generating any extra additional income to offset it. I guess I lost interest because when something doesn't grow, you tend to look for something else. And I guess people that came to it got tired of coming to it also. It's a combination of both. In the spring of 1984, it was announced that the castle would not be reopening. It took many of the employees by surprise. And we were out actually painting the fishing village out there. We were painting the whole pier. We weren't working inside them. The castle's all ready to go. And all of a sudden, someone came from the office and said, hey, stop painting. We're not opening this here. And we all thought it was a joke because we're always making stupid jokes like that. And it's like, yeah, it looks like we're not opening this year. And we're like, we just redid the castle and we did all this work here. We've been working up for months. Like, yeah, it looks like it's not happening. We, they're like, well, we'll call you in uh, a couple days. A couple days later, they called and said, no, we're not opening ever again. It's closed. And they invited us up and said, um, hey, do you want anything out of the building? And they actually let us take some souvenirs home. The pier remained closed for several years before Carmen finally sold the pier to a developer in April of 1987 for approximately $1 million. The developer planned to demolish the castle and build condos on the castle's former parking lot and a recreation area on the pier. These plans were hindered on September 25th, 1987, when the castle caught fire and burned to the ground. Ironically, this happened the same week that the castle was to be demolished. After an investigation, Two Atlantic City men were charged with starting the fire by breaking into the closed structure and dropping a lit cigarette into a pile of debris. Condos were eventually built on the castle's former parking lot in the early 2000s, but nothing was ever built at the former location of the pier because the pilings were destroyed in the fire. Before the castle burned, many props and artifacts were removed from the closed attraction and can still be found in personal collections. Oh, well, here's, here's something funny. This is the scepter from the, from the queen in Castle Brigantine, the rotted skeleton in the chair. This is her scepter she held. It was one of those old-fashioned Christmas balls the kids remember? <laughs> this is a Brigantine shield. There's a Brigantine suit of armor. That's Brigantine. That was outside on the fishing village or in the pier somewhere. Here's out of Brigantine. Remember I told you the frame that had the pictures that changed? This is what the frames were. It's the same frame that they use in the Haunted Mansion down Disney World for Master Gracie. Oh, here's a Brigantine skeleton head. So the way they did the skulls, because they were undersized, is they got them from Sculpture House up in New York, it's a sculpting supply company, and they built it up with Celastic to make it bigger with newspaper, and they did all the body out of uh, Celastic. As an owner, uh, it was a good return for the investment. I think it was a great thing for the young kids to learn about acting. For the town, I think it was a great attraction, and it was a great thing. We made memories that last a lifetime there. If you visit the former location of the castle, you would have no idea that a huge haunted attraction once stood on the beach, drawing hundreds of thousands of visitors to Brigantine each summer. But for those who had the opportunity to walk through the castle's lofty towers high above the sea, and its rat-infested dungeons and hidden graveyards. It was an experience that they will never forget.